hey, hopefully we can do this in one take and I'll try to be really clear and concise. I'm not uh, saying that I'm all knowing, so I'm going to present to you my experience. I, uh, I was raised in a Christian family. I went to Christian camp, studied the Bible a lot. I was surprised when I met uh, nice Buddhists, nice people from other countries. So I was like, whoa, uh, how does this work? You know, and some Christians that I met are not nice, you know, and so, hmm. And that combined with the uh, shiny, sexy side of the world that was, you know, poles on the flesh took me uh, on a 10 year journey away from Christianity, uh, you know, finding out about the history of the Middle Ages and the mess, uh, some of the messes that uh, at least part of the church has been in, uh, turned me off of Christianity. So uh, I was seeking, I would say I was a seeker. I feel like I was a pretty honest seeker, even though I was um, also quite you know, wrestling with lust, uh, sometimes not even wrestling with it, a slave to lust, slave to sometimes uh, fear or pride or just pleasure seeking or whatever. Uh, but I was also seeking and, and I always kind of had a sense, even though I, I was kind of like, wow, I don't know if I trust the Bible and all that, but I had a sense that there was a creator. I had a sense that there was more going on than meets the eye. Uh, even science now is saying that there's many spectrums, possibly, uh, you know, different, what we would call dimensions, um, and that consciousness is involved with reality, or at least our experience of it. And a bunch of other things led me to also some health trouble, too, and realizing that our health uh, is connected with our mental state and our emotional state. Um, uh, even, you know, digestive issues and things like that. So getting into uh, <laughs> praying when I'm in trouble, except I'm not sure who I'm praying to or if, you know, I'm not sure if uh, there was a time where I didn't know if I believed in anything or anything spiritual. Maybe it's all just, you know, hard matter atoms. That's it. Um, but I, I kind of had a sense and there's some things that happened that I was like, okay, I think there's spiritual reality going on. Um, and got into Tai Chi, Buddhism, went to Vipassana, which is a Theravada Buddhism from, well, originally India, but then uh, Burma. And that is, uh, yeah, like I did a 10 day uh, silent retreat where you're not silent the whole time. You can talk on the first day and the last day, but you can, uh, you're can. you generally meditating the whole time. And getting to experience the life of a monk, endeavoring to follow the five precepts, which are very moral. Right now, I'm just kind of telling you some of the uh, similarities or the qualities of Buddhism. So, you know, the five precepts are don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, no sexual immorality, um, no intoxicants. So uh, I've had some experience with meditating, did that for years, did Tai Chi, uh, Zen Buddhism. I've had experience um, with Tibetan lamas, which is from the Mahayana Buddhism. I've had some experience with Pure Land Buddhism, which is Chinese. Um, and Chinese Pure Land Buddhism is actually probably the closest to Christianity. We could talk about that in a minute. Anyway, and Zen Buddhism, martial arts, Qigong, which is more Taoism, but they're related um, in some ways. And so I'll, I'm going to also tell you that I have come back to Christ, or maybe a better way to put it is... I think a more accurate way is Christ said, okay, that's enough and came and got me. And uh, I have a faith in Jesus and uh, that the Bible is Holy Spirit inspired, despite the uh, issues with the church and problems with history. Uh, the church didn't, you know, turn into the 
megalithic, monolithic um, sort of political hierarchy that it was in the Middle Ages uh, for hundreds of years, uh, before, you know, when it was still early, like we're talking first generation eyewitnesses, they wrote the scriptures in the New Testament, and I believe that they were being honest and true, and that it was blessed by the Holy Spirit. In addition to the Hebrew scriptures and the ancient Hebrew writings and the prophecies of the Messiah and salvation and their conception, that's a worldview. So um, the people wonder, are those things compatible? Can you be a Christian Buddhist or how, what is the difference? Um, maybe some people think Buddha and Christ were both good teachers, both kind of had, um, you know, what could lead people to uh, in heaven or enlightenment or whatever. Um, both reported, well, I'll get into the, so let's talk about the commonalities. I'll read my list. So both the Christian worldview and the uh, Buddhist worldview are actually quite pessimistic about this uh, time space realm, this age, this earth experience as a human. Both Buddhism and Christianity say that essentially it's unsatisfying, it's actually harmful, there's selfishness and killing and it's uh, suffering. Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddha's main first truth of the Four Noble Truths was that life is suffering. And uh, Christianity would say that we live in a fallen situation, a fallen world, uh, that humanity fell, that we're, we've been poisoned with the sting of sin, that it's affected even our DNA, even the creation not just humans, but the whole creation is affected by sin, by that fall, by the rebellion, and that our minds are affected, that there is uh, lies that we are subject to, that we, uh, you know, are blind in a way. The Buddhists call that maya, perhaps. It's basically illusion. So uh, there's definitely kind of a, some pessimism right off the bat um, and some dissatisfaction with kind of the, the world status quo. So if everything's going peachy for you and you're just loving the world and maybe you're making a lot of money and you're healthy and you're, you know, got a lot of different partners and you think everything's going peachy, uh, Christianity and Buddhism would say that you're probably in for a rude awakening and that uh, it's dangerous to be satisfied in this realm. If everything's going well for you here, uh, you should ask some questions and also... Uh, yeah, because both Buddha and Jesus were provocative and revolutionary and caused friction with the established sort of economy and uh, with the established sort of priorities of humans and their their obsessions with external beauty and pleasure and just transitory things. So uh, life is uh, in a world of suffering, this earth right now. Both Christianity and Buddhism would, would agree on that in a lot of ways. They would agree that worshipping stone idols, uh, worshipping anything material, maybe some people think, oh, worshipping idols is silly. But actually, some people, I've worked at a car dealership where people come in and worship vehicles, really fancy sports cars. Uh, some people, their identity is in their sports team. Um, and you know, the, the material or women really are a little bit too attached to that diamond that they want on that ring. Um, the size and carrots and whatever. Um, so worshiping the physical, uh, worshiping anything, uh, that's just part of this creation is actually condemned both in Christianity and Buddhism. Um, cause, uh, Gautama, who is, uh, the man they call Buddha, uh, Prince Sakyamuni, also known as Siddhartha. He was born in India about 500 or 600 BC. There's actually not a lot of um, re like really close writing, like a testament that's written right after him. Actually, his writings were collected many, many generations after. Uh, but we, we think they were fairly faithfully preserved so I'm not going to get into questioning whether the texts are are you know word for word but I think that 
his teachings were pretty faithfully preserved. The ancient traditions of passing on um, teachings was not like the game of telephone. People think, oh, you know, these things have been changed because it's like the game of telephone. The game of telephone's rules are you whisper, you whisper in somebody's ear and you can only whisper once and then they have to repeat it. They can't ask for clarification and then it goes around the circle and there's people that are being silly. Um, the ancient sort of disciple master uh, relationship or the rabbis, they would generally, you know, you would memorize things. They would check back and forth. It would be done in public. So the, the integrity of oral traditions is actually really solid. So that goes both for the Hebrew scriptures and uh, the New Testament was written down very quickly after. So I, there wasn't even a very long oral tradition with the Christian New Testament. You, I believe it's trustworthy. Uh, even when they find ancient documents, you know, there might be a little word here or there off, but it doesn't affect the main meaning. It's kind of like a hologram where you can change a few little details, but you're always going to get the same message. Uh, and in Buddhism, I, I think probably most of the teachings were, were pretty, most of the sayings were pretty faithful. Um, but anyway, they weren't written down until hundreds of years after Gautama Buddha. But anyway, he was uh, born and lived in India in 500 or six around 500 bc so this was before christ it's doubtful he had much knowledge of hebrews or even the ten commandments of the hebrew scriptures now there was uh some there was some interaction between india and all the way to africa there was definitely cultural transmission and some sharing probably more than we think there was uh so who knows but um he had a worldview that was essentially brought up in Hinduism, which ha already had ideas of kind of a cycle going round and round and round. Um, and interesting, if you read in the Hebrew literature from King Solomon from 1000 BC, you get a lot of similar conclusions. Um, you know, life is kind of meaningless and empty and there's nothing new under the sun and everything's going round and round and round and people are just chasing things, but they can't find true satisfaction. This sort of wrestling experience that King Solomon was, who King Solomon was dubbed the wisest human ever. Um, and I think when, well, I know that when Jesus came, he said one greater than Solomon is here. So he was claiming something pretty big. But uh, Gautama, interesting, had a lot of similar conclusions. So maybe there was some transmission. And also, you know, Gautama, Buddha, looked around at nature. He meditated. He, um, You can learn a lot from nature. So you can have similar revelations of truth in different places by observing nature, creation, the, the order of seasons, the, the, you know, rising and passing of a day and seasons and life and um the different stages and so he was yeah he had some revelations of, of truth and how things worked uh and so interesting it, his teachings read a lot like ecclesiastes in in some ways ecclesiastes was king solomon's writings the writings of the teacher from 1000 bc both of those perspectives are pre-christian meaning they're not operating with a full knowledge of the plan of redemption of a savior. Now, there was a uh, sort of prophecies of, of um, a chosen one, a hero, a redeemer all over the world. And that goes back to Adam and Eve and Noah, Enoch, you know, there'd been, there'd been prophecies of a Messiah uh, for a long time. Uh, Buddha actually in the stories there was a prophecy about him that he would be either a great king or a great religious man and his dad you know when he was born uh, a prophet probably Hindu came to his dad and told him this your son's going to be a great prophet a spiritual leader or he's going to be a great king worldly leader and his dad was like I don't have much time for spirituality I want my son to be a great king he surrounded with them all the surrounded the the palace with all the pleasures and tried to protect his son from seeing any suffering so he wouldn't be cued to question this reality and um that changed when Gotama went for a walk and he saw a sick man he saw a dying man a dead man an old man and um anyway had some experiences of basically seeing whoa this is what this is where things are going i don't know if it's worth it even even um you know, being 
participating in all this pleasure and good. So he took off and went on a spiritual journey and uh, did a bunch of yoga and meditation and fasting and really trying to punish his body, realizing I don't want to just be a slave to pleasure. And, and then he kind of realized that wasn't the way either. And, uh, you know, trained with a bunch of teachers and they couldn't help him because he would get to their level and eventually sat under a tree and said that he had an experience that was like enlightenment and liberation and realized some things. And so we're going to talk about that. And uh, so anyway, back to similarities, both we battle lies in Christianity and in Buddhism. It's, you know, battling illusion, Buddhists call it, uh, Buddhism calls it Maya. Christianity would say that it's the deception of the enemy, the deception of sin, the brokenness of our minds, the brokenness of our, um, really it's a deadness of spirit. It's a, it's a, even though we're, our souls are alive, if you think about it like a bullseye, the Christian worldview is that you have a spirit in the middle, soul, which is your mind, will, emotions, your personality, and then your body. And so you can be a body that's alive with a mind, will, and emotions, but your spirit is under the curse of sin is dead. And that death eventually works its way out to the mind, will, and emotions. You know, maybe it could be an example of um, someone getting Alzheimer's and dementia and all these things breaking down. Uh, but Buddhism and Christianity would say that even if you think you're healthy and you don't have dementia, you still probably are under delusion and believing some lies and even uh, far into the journey, you're still wrestling with lies, lies about our identity, lies about reality, lies about the, the beginning and the end, if there is one, whatever, purpose, um, fulfillment, truth, all of those things. So uh, we battle also the world and the flesh. We battle, there's a world system and, and Gautama and Buddha said that the monks were not allowed to handle money. They were not um, uh, initially allowed to marry. Well, there was there was some you could be married or be single, but there was definitely um, you know prescriptions, I guess you could say, or or uh, prohibit prohibitions on alcohol, drugs, uh, trying to get rich and have a lot of stuff. Um, basically, saying these are are. Um, not going to make you happy and even bad karma they are when you do something uh and i guess we could talk about karma now the idea in, in buddhism is when you tell a lie for example even if you don't get caught even if no one finds out that's like a tying a knot in your in your brain in your your spirit in your the essence and and it's kind of a challenging concept because also in buddhism there is no sort of central localized uh, self, even though he says you experience that, basically Buddhism has this idea you're kind of like a Pinocchio. You're just put together, and there's actually you know five aggregates that are putting you together, but you're like a, a concrete that's put together. But there is no sort of central self. But we experience this sort of like central self, which ultimately uh, Buddha says is, is an illusion, and um, says that. Uh, when you, uh, you know, are lustful or do something bad, you know, you hurt someone or you rip somebody off, you tell a lie or you're greedy and you don't help someone or, you know, you commit adultery or whatever, uh, lust after a person, all of these types of things, steal, kill, you, that you're causing this bent that when you're again, life force or whatever goes on and uh, it's going to come back to you. You reap what you sow. And Christianity has that same idea, similar, that sin stains you, that you reap what you sow. That's a, from the Old Testament. That there is, uh, be sure your sin will find you out. And that uh, both actually have the idea that true liberation, that uh, heaven or nirvana, cannot be reached unless you are perfect. You have to be aerodynamic like it's like if you're a rocket that's trying to get off of the earth that gravity is so much that basically you get pulled back down and there's friction and uh christianity actually says that as a human no matter how good you are you cannot you don't have enough propulsion and you can't be aerodynamic enough to get out of that gravity field you are stuck to earth and uh, Buddhism would say that, you know, Gautama makes this claim that he, he was flawless after 
eons and eons and billions of lifetimes, you know, purified himself and went through all the suffering and paid off his karma by meditating and burning it off and seeing through the uh, illusion. And he, he actually kind of was able to get his consciousness out of that gravitational pull. Um, whether he did or not, uh, that's questionable because I think there's some flaws, there's still some bugs in the system. And both Christianity and Buddhism say that you have to be totally perfect and flawless to get to heaven, to be in the presence of uh, bliss, of God, of the Most High and the Source. And actually Buddhism has issues with uh, whether there's a creator. It's sort of a vague, foggy thing because Buddhism is based on experience and knowing, which is a little bit different than the creator in Hebrew and Christianity, where the creator in Hebrew and Christianity, in essence, uh, desires faith. And so if, if the creator is deciding that you're not going to find him at that point, and that the creator is saying, you have to seek for me, but you also have to trust, um, then someone can meditate and look around the universe with their spiritual sight. And like Gotama, he said that he looked as far back as he could in time and he looked as far forward as he could in time and he couldn't see a beginning or an end. Uh, whereas in Christianity, there's a definite beginning and an end. Uh, so for me, drawing a circle around one of them and saying, well, one of them has to be inside of one of the other ones. Um, that's, we'll get to that. Uh, continuing on, more similarities, there is a spiritual realm. Buddhism says, yeah, there's a spiritual realm. There's demons, ghosts, um, uh, disembodied spirits, uh, types of deities, types of spirit, powerful spiritual beings. Uh, but Gautama says none of those are permanent. So you can have a type of God, I guess, like a Hindu type of God or whatever that, but they're still born and, and they pass away. They're still, they still arise and pass away. But in, in Buddhist conception, it's could be millions and billions of years or something. Whereas, uh, but th there's an idea that there is the a heaven realm and a hell realm. I was actually upset about that. When I found about, out about that in, in Buddhism, I was upset because part of what turned me off about Christianity was that, you know, this idea of that some souls would be lost, that would be burn, burning, you know, eternal damnation, suffering in hell, whether, they're, whether it's conscious or total annihilation, the type of like burning. And actually Gotama describes seven layers of hell and seven layers of heaven that are a part of the Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist worldview, and says that you can, you can be stuck there. Now that in Buddhism, you're never stuck anywhere permanently, um, which is part of uh, their, the conception of, of this realm. And actually, I think in our current world, in our current age with this fallen creation, it's actually accurate in a way that uh, things are changing. And so we see that, you know, we don't see much permanent. So believing in permanence is, is uh, a bit of a different story, but both actually do. Um, that's where Buddha kind of contradicts himself because if he's believing that there's this structure of reality that you cycle through, then that structure would be permanent. So to say that everything arises and passes away and then to say that there is this structure, which is kind of a eternal structure that you kind of go through and there's these seven hell realms and seven heaven realms and you kind of go around and around and if you're bad you go to the hell realms and if you're good you go up to the heaven realms you might suffer for 10,000 years burning with fire in a hell realm this is buddha said this and a lot of people that are say they're buddhist don't really understand buddhism and they don't really uh it's sort of a cultural you know they get a statue and they go to some yoga classes and um that's that's not Buddhism, and even Gotama himself would not uh, condone that sort of idea of like, yeah, it's all relative. A lot of people use this sort of Buddhist idea to kind of hide behind so that they can have like a relativistic, non, you know, moral truth life, you know, where there's, well, you know, I don't really believe in a god or a creator, so I don't have to believe in morality. But Buddha actually had these concepts like it's all it's 
always bad to lie or, you know, all of this type of thing. Now there is like little things about skillful means, but there is a structure to Buddhist cosmology, which is presented as being permanent, which kind of contradicts his um, philosophies. But in, even like I said, King Solomon noted that, you know, that everything's always going round and round and changing and the seasons are going round and round. And so down here, there's, there is a level of constant change happening. So that's another similarity. I'm trying to stick with similarities, but as we talk about them, they bring up differences. Hopefully you're still interested. So the idea of uh, a heaven, a hell, earth, spiritual realm, invisible energy stuff, deeper dimensions, all that is, is similar in Christianity and Buddhism. Um, other types of beings um, that are invisible to us and that sort of thing. Uh, ourselves and our mind is infected and a tricky obstacle. That is another similarity with both Buddhism and Christianity. Buddhist, Gautama says uh, that our mind is like a hunter that's camouflaged in the forest. You're like in a jungle. You're walking through the jungle and the, imagine a, a camouflaged hunter is hunting you in the jungle. He, uh, you know, bow and arrow ready to pop up any time and ah, I got a shot in the leg, you know, hamstrung or whatever. Gautama says your mind is actually like that. It's tricky and it doesn't want you to be liberated. And in many ways, your enemy, your worst, your most challenging enemy is yourself. And uh, your sort of subconscious lusts and fears and whatever, uh, cravings and aversions. And Christianity is similar in that saying that the flesh, not just the fleshy body, but the fallen human nature, the flesh, the self that's trying to be God itself is desperately wicked. The, in the Hebrew scriptures, it says the heart is desperately wicked. It's sinful beyond cure. Uh, in, you know, in, who can know the depths of it? You can't even know the depths of your own motivations a lot of times. And that's in, or it's, you know, very hard to know the depths of your own spirit. And, and uh, that was a conception before Christ of, of both sort of a similar conception as, as in Buddhism, that ourselves and our mind are infected. That, that's a tricky obstacle. We can't even keep our own codes of morality. So whether or not you subscribe to the Ten Commandments or uh, whatever, the five Buddhist precepts, or maybe you have your own code of what you think is right or wrong. Maybe you even boil it down to something simple like the golden rule, something you think is simple like the golden rule. Maybe... You say, well, I have my own morality and I just try to, you know, be a good person and not lie. And, and um, you think like, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to do unto others as they would have done on do or I'm going to do unto others as I would have them do unto me. You know, I'm going to follow the golden rule. Like that was what Jesus said. There's kind of a similar, the Gautama's conception of it is different. He said, don't do to other people what you would not want done to yourself. So it's sort of like, don't hurt other people. Uh, Jesus raised the bar a bit and said, do unto others. So, you know, someone on the, and you might think, well, I'm like that. I follow the golden rule. But actually, when we examine it deeply, none of us on our own can keep our, our own moral standards, let alone the moral standards of, of a, you know, religion or faith or teacher. We fail ourselves. Um, you know, if you were in Africa starving right now, what would you want someone that was in the first world, Canada or United States or whatever, Europe, wherever you're watching this, what would you want you to do if you were starving in Africa? And what would you, how would you want someone to choose to spend their, mon their money and their time? Um, pretty sure you wouldn't be that concerned with whether someone had Netflix. If you were in Africa starving right now, you'd be like, no, they should keep Netflix. I hope that they check. You know, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to say I'm any better. I'm just saying that the bar for morality is way higher than we think it is. And what's interesting is we don't even keep our own morality. So um, we're in a pickle. That's what my mom would say. We're in a pickle. Buddha and Jesus would agree on that and uh that yeah we talked about karma and sin the idea of you reap what you sow in buddhism there's no forgiveness for your sins uh it's 
in a way it's merciless it's like a judge that's just like this is what you did you get equal and opposite reaction it's very much kind of scientific you put this in you get that out um and although there's you know in buddhism there's this idea that you can kind of burn off or pay karma by you know doing good deeds or meditating and sort of suffering through these uh times of pain coming and going and you know being equanimous and stuff like that um, but basically both agree that you have to be perfect to make it out. And both of them agree you, you want to make it out. This, re this realm, this current state of earth, eventually, even if you kind of like it and it's nice and maybe you're young and you see a beautiful sunset, like, hey, creation is beautiful. Even though it's fallen, I think it's beautiful. There's lots of beauty uh, and wonderful things. But this realm, when you realize how much suffering is going on here, uh, yeah, It cannot be allowed to continue and will not be. And Gotama, you know, Buddha said the same, you got to get out of here. That's like the most ethical thing you can do is stop participating in this reality. It's actually really pessimistic. He's, it's basically kind of like spiritual suicide. Although, you know, there's an, there's a kind of argument to be made that it's, it's getting out of it, but there's also an element of like, you kind of, Realize you don't exist and stop existing and stop trying to, you know, fill yourself up with other, uh, on other people's suffering. Um, hmm, I, there's a short story that I'll tell you. It was a philo philosophical, I went to university, I've studied philosophy at university and I don't have a degree in it, but I, I have a degree in English literature, which is actually pretty awesome because it involves analyzing ideas and texts and philosophy but i did do some courses and one of the thought experiments we had was imagine there was a perfect world nobody's sick everybody's got a house and food and you know netflix and whatever uh you can walk down the street and you know the kids can be skipping after dark and there's no danger uh, but the caveat is that that perfect world is that way because one person one child is in a basement somewhere being tortured. Just one. You have seven billion people in the world living happily, but one child is being tortured. Would it be worth it? Would you say, okay, let's do that? When you knowingly are saying, yeah, we're gonna torture that person, but look how much good it's gonna do, you know? Um, it's a thought experiment and ethic. It's an ethical thing, you know. Well, it would. Some people think, well, it would be better in our world right now. People are being tortured anyway, so let's do it. But at the same time, you're agreeing to that. All of a sudden, now you're culpable. Whereas, you know, in that kind of thought experiment. Whereas right now you're, we're in this, but hopefully you're not torturing children, and uh, you would stop it if you knew about it. And then that begs the question, or that sort of extends and goes, wait a minute. If we look around, we actually do know about situations that are really bad on the other side of the world or even in our communities. How much are we doing? Uh, is our society run kind of like that where a bunch of people can be happy, but some of the people are in the gutter and kind of getting run over by our economy, by our comforts, by the choices and the purchases we make, by how, you know, even animals you get the cheaper meat because it's cheaper and where does it come from you know um so ethically it's it's a tough quandary like i said it's a pickle um christianity sort of says that the creator comes down and says i'll be that person suffering and being tortured so that you can have eternal happiness and jesus got tortured and so it, um, there's an interesting kind of connection there. Uh, both, we're going to get along here. We're almost done the, uh, we're kind of part most way through, I could say, uh, similarities. Both have morality. We talked about that. There's the five initial commandments of Buddhism or the five precepts, I guess you could say. The five, um, you know, sort of entry level morality. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Uh, lying includes like if someone asks you how you're doing and you're having a bad day and then you say like oh, i'm good uh actually that's a lie <laughs> if you're not good and you say you're good that's a lie and um 
So that's what one. That's the reason why a vipassana. You don't talk for eight days. It's not just to, so you can focus and meditate. It's so that you don't lie. Um. Anyway, uh, don't steal, don't kill, no sexual immorality. That means sex is a man and a woman in marriage. So even uh, Buddha would not approve of homosexual sex. A lot of people that are like, I'm not Christian, I'm Buddhist, because they have to consider that as well. So, um, and Jesus said basically the same thing that in the beginning, God created man and woman and made them to become one and, uh, and, uh, that would make life, but also a type of union and life that's not just the children, but they would make life together as one, become one flesh, and, and that that unit was meant to be a man and a woman together, and uh, sort of like plugging a cord, plugging an electrical cord into a socket, you could say, as a vivid metaphor, and, you know, trying to put two of the other ones together is part of brokenness. Both Buddhism and Christianity would agree with with that, I would say, um, from my knowledge, anyway. Uh, so there's morality. There's no intoxicants. Don't get drunk or stoned. No smoking pot. Buddha would not approve of that. So if you say you're into Buddhism and you're hitting the bong or rolling joints, that's a problem. And because you're getting you're getting karma, sankaras, you're participating in something that's actually will lead to illusion and damage, uh, and then you will reap the consequences of that. Christianity is kind of similar. Actually, Christianity allows for some level of, you know, drinking wine and beer, believing that it's actually in moderation, can be enjoy enjoyable, as long as with Christianity, it's more a question of the heart. What Jesus is saying is, are you looking to any substance for your joy, your comfort, your peace? You know, you have a stressful day. Do you go smoke a cigarette? If, the, if you do, then that's a problem. That's an idol for you. Uh not to mention it's bad for your body and and Jesus says like basically that we our bodies are the temple of the holy spirit we're meant to be full of the holy spirit and meant to be taken care of we don't even own ourselves and actually that's a similarity between buddhism and christianity in a way the analogy of pinocchio the story of pinocchio is kind of a, an interesting story because Pinocchio is a stick man. He's, he has an existence, but he's not a real boy. Uh, Gotama kind of says, you need to realize you're just made of sticks and strings and get over yourself and not get attached to anything and get out. And then you the sticks and strings kind of come apart and you get to be nothing. And Whereas Jesus says, it's kind of more like the Pinocchio story where it says, yeah, you're made of sticks and strings. You're just a created you know thing. But actually, if you believe in me, you're in a relationship reconciled with your creator, um, then there's a miracle that happens and you become a real boy, a real entity, a real person, a self. Um, whereas, uh, you know, like I said, Gotama was, was 500 years before Christ. He did not have a full conception of uh, the plan of redemption. I don't know if he, I, there's, it's not likely that he was reading the Hebrew scriptures and the prophecies of the Messiah and that there would be a time of no suffering. There would be a time of no sickness, no death. So he just looked at the baseline and kind of found out the program and realized, oh, there's like suffering embedded in this program. And Christianity would agree, but Christianity says that at some point the creator is going to change the ones and zeros and fix, like it's going to be a totally different operating system. It's not going to be sort of this yin yang light dark death life cycle over and over um, because that is how things operate here you know a tree dies in the forest and that tree needs to die in the forest in a way for the forest to survive because then that decomposes and the soil's richer and then a new one grows that's how things operate right now admittedly life death you know wah, wah, wah. but christianity and christ have this like revolutionary ideas radical it's like there's gonna be no more death no more sickness no more suffering no more tears you know um there may be tears of joy al allowed but anyway uh it's gonna be all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff whereas buddha says oh the good stuff and bad stuff are connected so don't take either of them because even if you take the, the good stuff, you're going to end up with a bunch of bad stuff. It's not going to be satisfying. So that's kind of the essence of it. Both of them uh, talk about being still. Buddhism and Christianity both talk about being still. Um, that stillness, 
I guess a nice analogy is of a, a puddle, you know, if, or a, a lake or something. If the wind is whipping in all the water or some kid is kicking and splashing in the puddle, it's going to be probably dirty and muddled. You won't be able to see clearly. So there's this idea of when everything's still, sediment can settle and you can see clearly. Uh, the difference is that in Christianity, in the Hebrew and Christian worldview, uh, the full verse says, be still and know that I am God. So it's about relationship. It's, it's not about just being still and being empty. It's about being still and emptying in a way, but also then being full of the Holy Spirit, being full of God, connecting. Um, and some some Buddhism has an idea of like kind of a full emptiness. That's more Taoism. But um, anyway, the... The, I would say, kind of Buddha got half of it. He said, yeah, you got to be still. And Jesus came 500 years later and was like, yeah, be still and be full of the Holy Spirit. Be connected. Um, both have an idea of no fear. Like that they realize fear is a bad thing. Uh, it's not going to help you. Um, it In Gautama's idea, humans are basically motivated by either craving or aversion. Like wanting, desiring, and and trying to get something to fill them up or whatever, or being afraid of trying to keep themselves alive, or being afraid of having something taken away from them. Um, so, and and um, in Christianity, actually, though, there is a fear that is condoned, and in and in the Hebrew scriptures, which is the fear of the Lord, which is a an, a reverence and honoring a, a type of awe and respect that type of fear. Like if you see a big grizzly bear, uh, you might not want to just go and play with the cubs. You might want to, you know, just be back away and take a different path. That's the type of like, whoa, you know, this, I could be annihilated very quickly right now. Um, a respect, a fear, but it's a fear that actually the, the Hebrew scripture, the Proverbs say, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's interesting that it's the beginning right? Because I don't think it's the end. Fear of the Lord is always going to be there because our creator is like, you know, the universe is his throne and the universe is amazing enough to, for us to be like, whoa, mind blowing. So if the universe is his throne, um, the heavens are his throne, the earth is his footstool. And we're like, there's always going to be that awe and it's always going to be new and learning more, I guess. But and a respect so fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but I think once you get to know the character of our creator, which is what Jesus came to embody and show, that that's why we call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then you realize it actually turns to love. Love is, let's say, the end of wisdom. Um, love in Buddhism, like a sort of deep love, uh, and joy are actually considered problematic because they can be attachments. So there's a level of equanimity that's and that's promoted. A type of well wishing, a type of met. It's called metta, metta, which is like type of kindness, loving kindness. But at the same time, it's it's like a wishing you well kind of thing. But it's not like a deep intimate you know loving relationship or, or falling in love that is actually you know buddha says that's getting back on the roller coaster um and you're gonna be in for suffering and jesus would counter that and say yes and i'm gonna pay the suffering but i'm all about the lo he's a lover for sure uh so the christianity is more about the roller coaster whereas buddha's kind of like no i'm trying to take the middle path Christianity says, uh, we're here to be in love and it's a big romance and there are suffering. And Jesus said, I actually paid and went to the bottom rung. Um, that said, uh, talking about rungs, both men did descend from being rich to the bottom rung of society. They both willingly were poor, willingly, uh, you know, lived a life of poverty, had nothing, um, shared everything with their disciples were um went to the bottom rung in terms of had no kind of class system of like you have to be a noble to hang out with me um it was not about that so the the appearances the externals the materialism security all of that type of stuff 
both Buddhism and Christianity say those are empty illusions and going to cause you suffering if you're clinging to them and trying to get your identity and your comfort from those things. They also would say that it's it's not essentially bad if you have a house or some, you know, money in the bank for groceries next week. Um but Jesus said, you must forsake everything you have to follow, to be my disciple. No one can be my disciple unless he forsakes everything he has. And that's because you can't have competing loyalties. It's like you can't marry someone if you're still kind of sort of dating someone. Or, I mean, maybe in our day and age, people think they can. But to have a monogamous marriage, you have to be, you know, totally 100% devoted and not like not say like, oh, I only sleep with that person once a year with that other person you know it's like no you have to forsake all other lovers all other devotions and connections even uh family to the extent that it would compete you know the bible is very pro family in many ways honoring your father and mother but even then even that jesus was like you need to relative to following him you need to hate your father and mother <laughs> that's what he said you know he did. He. I don't think he meant hate because that wouldn't be consistent with other things that he said about taking care of your father and mother, respecting them. But he, he was in the Hebrew. That basically means love less. You have to love them less. Um, so, like in comparison with really good ice cream, I hate broccoli. You know, actually, I, I like broccoli too, but I love it less than really delicious ice cream. Although broccoli's good too. But anyway, both uh, value. Uh, the essence or the source of reality. They say there's a deeper truth going on than meets the eye and needs to be sought for. Um, Buddhism, though, would say it comes all out of emptiness, whereas Christianity would say that God created and from, from nothing sprang everything from the creative uh, power of God and genius of God, all the principles of, and we're not talking just matter and energy. We're talking the principles of gravity, the principles of buoyancy, the principles of aerodynamics, the principles of uh, thermodynamics. All of that is laws that are part of creation. So when you think about creation, don't just think, well, the big bang created everything. Well, those there's physics that needs to account for that laws of physics, principles and uh, order and, the idea of like an atom, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, and all that, how it works, and numbers, oneness, twoness, threeness, upness, downness. I mean, we're talking major. Get to the root of it here. Um, interestingly, Gautama, in his meditation, kind of realized that he we are made of a little bit little energy balls that pop in and out of existence he said we're just made of little energy balls that pop in and out of existence he called them carapas uh, maybe that could be akin to the quantum physicists saying that we're um our you know the physical matter comes out of quantum foam and is like little quirks and quarks and you know subatomic particles popping in and out of existence and um some hang around longer than others. And uh, so that could be like, I think those revelations could be true. Like I think definitely Gautama was a hit on some revelations. I don't know where, if he got his, you know, there was a type of um, learning that he got from looking around and seeing life. And there was a type of learning he got from meditation and like sort of sensing himself and exploring himself through meditation. There also could have been, like both Buddhism and, and Christianity talk about, there are demons, there are uh, sources of knowledge. And in Christianity, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was something that humans were not supposed to eat. They were supposed to eat from the tree of life. And in that life, in that relationship with God, then the knowledge would would come the knowledge the knowing you know not the gnosis which actually means like you know kind of becoming one whereas with adam and eve and the original humans and their fall they chose to basically try to be their own gods and know for themselves and that's where uh, gotama kind of falls into that category because he was all about knowing he said you know you experiment you do these things you will find out you'll know 
Um, there's no sort of higher authority to, to account to or to try to get saved by. So there is a dangerous sense of like the tree of knowledge of good and evil that, and who knows if the enemy was inserting some, some lies or some experiences there. But both men, like I said, were poor and both men reportedly did miracles, had superpowers, could m manipulate the laws of physics, um, time, space, you know, whatever. Um, Uh, so I think that covers the similarities. Differences are really important. Uh, before we go into differences, I'm just going to give you a little bit of variety. And Oh, no, I'll wait for that. I'll just give you a little. No, there's, there's something I want to show you. I'll give you a little whoop, something. Anyway, a little whiteboard. So it'll, it'll clarify. So the differences... Because there's some people that are like, oh, I'm into both, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. And, and to be honest, religion is not what Christians are called to either. It's, it's actually relationship, which then, you know, the word religion, it's good to look into it. You should probably research the root of it. But the word religion in our day and age is used kind of like a swear word, like, oh, you're, you're religious or how religious are you or whatever. Um, it didn't used to be used in that context but buddhism does many buddhists don't even claim that buddhism is a religion they say it's like a technique or a philosophy or a way of trying to get out of suffering um and live harmoniously whereas uh christianity a lot of christians would say it's not a religion it's a relationship and then from that springs you know, your actions and things anyway the differences um there's a lot like even though there's similarities. Uh, one of the similarities also is that you shouldn't hold bitterness. So right now, if you have any unforgiveness, if you have any hate towards someone or bitterness, uh, that's eating you up. It's poison, really bad karma, sin. Uh, Jesus said, unless you forgive others, you won't be forgiven. He's like, I'm dying on the cross. I'm paying for your karma, your sin. You need to now forgive others, accept that grace and pass it on. Not because you deserve it and not because they deserve it. And so it's not condoning what they did. There's a difference between uh, forgiving and condoning. You can still say that was a wrong thing. I don't condone that, but I'm releasing them. I'm releasing the bitterness. I'm praying for the best for them. Um, I'm praying for their liberation, salvation. Um, and Gautama would say the same thing. If you're bitter, if you're hating, that's really bad. Like you're going to get just dragged down. You know, if you died in that state, you're going to the realms of suffering with any sort of, you know. Uh, so just right now, forgive everyone you can and bless them and pray for them and wish the best. Like that's a baseline similarity. Uh, even though there's different foundations, it's just really important. Sort of like... If someone's hungry, feed them, regardless of whether you're Buddhist or Christian. Like, let's just get this person fed. Um, anyway, but talking about the differences, uh, Gotama did not say he was God. Gotama actually said, I'm not God. I looked as far as I could, couldn't see the beginning of creation, couldn't see the end, couldn't see if there was a, couldn't find any eternal being. I kind of saw like these beings in heavenly realms that are they may live for millions and billions of years eons or whatever but uh they arise and pass away too and this sort of are part of the creation he just explored creation he couldn't see anything beyond that basically said that there is that he basically insinuated there's no god this was definitely like you need to get your pull up yourself from your bootstraps us there's going to be the the Sangha, the community, the Dharma, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha that can help you to get liberated as part of that way. Those are the three uh, gems. Um, so the Buddha is like Gotama, um, but the Dharma is the way. That's what it means, basically, the way, the path, the eightfold path. So those are like how to do things right, trying to be right, do right thinking, right livelihood, have a job that doesn't hurt people, that sort of thing, right meditation, right worldview, all that right speech right action it's a pretty tall order i'm just telling you um and then the sangha is like the community so both gotama and jesus actually really recognize that humans are not meant to be alone there is a, a connection with community that is essential but 
Buddha essentially said, no one's going to save you, you have to do it yourself. Whereas in Christianity, Jesus did, be, did claim to be the I am, the one that is Yahweh. That means the I am that I am. That's the name that uh, Creator told Moses. Our Father in Heaven said to Moses, before I was called El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Now I'm, I, I'm telling you my name is Yahweh or Yahweh. Given different pronunciations, but it means the I am that I am. Anyway, um, so Christ uh, claimed to be one with the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. People asked him uh, certain things, and he answered with Yahweh, I am, you know, uh, which was, he said, before Abraham was, I am, which is interesting. He didn't say I was. Before, that's like grammatically, you would think you would say, before Abraham was, I I was, but he actually said before Abraham was, I am. Whoa. He, uh, they tried to stone him for that, but he knew it wasn't his time. So he just, whoop, you know, he, they tried to kill him a bunch of times and he didn't, he, it was like, it's not time. And he would walk right by them. So when he died, he was submitting to that for his purposes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were involved. And it was part of the plan from the beginning for the revelation, not of, for the revelation, not only just of our forgiveness, but the revelation of the heart of the creator, the revelation of grace and the revelation of this sort of like most high coming down to the most low and redeeming and loving and that whole uh, revelation of grace and, and goodness and love, uh, mercy triumphing over judgment, all that. And in order for that, there needed to be the groundwork of the Hebrew Old Testament and Israel and uh, the law and try people, you know, in the Hebrew conception, people were trying to earn their righteousness by following the law, which is similar. Pretty much every religion, including some versions of Christianity, is people trying to earn the, their righteousness and be perfect on their own. Whereas true Christianity, according to Christ, is you believe in Him, you trust in Him. That that means you accept His righteousness, that His payment of sins, that there's an exchange that goes on that He suffered for you, so that you could actually experience what he deserves. You got what we deserve as rebels, as fallen humans, as sinful, you know, treason, treasoners or whatever with the enemy. Um, Cause this is not just about humans. It's about that there was like controversy in the heavenly realms with created beings, with angels um, questioning the creator and stuff. So this is part of that revelation. So, uh, going on with the uh, differences, Christianity says there's an eternal, unchanging God. Uh, so, you could kind of draw a circle around this realm or this reality, and you could say there's an eternal, unchanging God that's, you know, creating and upholding this system, is intimately involved with it, and yet can't be, like, reached out and grabbed. So, you can say, look, I got him right here, so I can prove it. There's an element of faith. There's an element of... Uh, that we are not having complete knowledge of that right now, but we're growing into it. We see through a glass darkly. It's like looking at night in a dark mirror or something. Uh, so Gotama basically says you have to follow the Eightfold Path for liberation and to get out. And Christianity says it's the cross. It's through what Christ accomplished. And you receive that and you walk in that relationship. It's a reconciliation with our Creator um to uh, die to the old self when you're baptized like going under the water and coming up again that's you're saying i identify that the fallen nature and the old self is crucified with christ and i'm risen with him and uh, yeah dead buried with him risen with him and that there's a unity now that cannot be broken and uh, hopefully then people grow and walk in that and it's that's a challenging walk too to maintain growing in grace and knowledge and knowing Christ and uh, yes there are morality but the morality is flowing out of like a love you know if you really love your husband you're gonna I don't know act a certain way it's not like you have to do this you're gonna get whipped um, so differences the span and the scope of sight so Christ talked about the beginning and the end he actually said I am the beginning and the end um, that was pretty big uh whereas Gotama kind of said oh, I've 
explored these heaven layers and hell hell realms and I've looked back as far as I can and frontward and there's no rhyme or reason there's no kind of purpose to our existence here uh, just get out it's kind of like actually chaos and a big bad dream um, kind of pessimistic actually and but actually kind of honest when he's describing the fallen world you know and he again didn't have knowledge of the redemption the plan of redemption and christ and the messiah coming and the new the restoration of all things that sort of thing anyway um yeah and i think he didn't have complete knowledge and there was maybe some bugs in the system there and some twists and things uh the claims we already covered gotama said he wasn't god christ basically did although you know he said he was the son of god too so there's this kind of like trinity question uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and three persons, one entity. I, I like to use the analogy of an egg. An egg is one. An egg also has a shell, a white, and a yolk. Uh, there's other analogies too. Um, water is can be ice, liquid, or steam. I don't know. I, I To say that we can fully conceive of, of God in, in this little, like, however big your brain is and heart and whatever... Uh, we know in part right now. So there is elements of not fully knowing. And Gotama Buddha was uncomfortable with not knowing. Or he would say, like, tr you have to try something, and if it starts working, then you can go with it. Uh, whereas with faith, it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings. When, when they step out on that, they actually have to step before the bridge appears. When they step out on that chasm, they step, and then the bridge appears. Whereas, uh, anyway, there's both. There is an element of kind of going from unknowing to knowing and trust uh, in both, but it's it's different in that belief and faith, trust and relying on Christ is central. Um, and some Buddhas have turned Buddhism, some Buddhists have turned Buddhism into a religion where they worship Buddha, they pray to Buddha, they worship statues, they offer offerings. He wouldn't... Um, approve of that he didn't accept worship and he didn't accept worshiping statues um made of you know metal or wood or whatever but there is an element of like trying to tune into buddha and ask for help that there is in buddhism um a sort of compassion but uh he said if there's this saying if you see the buddha in the street kill him that's a buddhist saying because they basically said he promised that he was not going to come back because it was not worth coming back here for. So if you saw him and he came back, uh, kill him because he's lying. <laughs> That's kind of the idea. Because he basically said, I'm out. But he left the the teaching or the method, which he called the way. I'm, he said, I'm just pointing people to the way. And this is actually like really interesting because Jesus didn't say that he was showing people a way. He said, I am the way. He was saying, look at me, watch me, emulate me, get to know me. I am the way. Um, and in Taoism, the Tao basically kind of translates as the way, the Tao. And yin and yang are like these paradoxical polarities, but they have this unity in the Tao. And there's so many paradoxes which, have, which find their unity in Christ. Um, God and humans. He's fully God, fully man. Um, truth and grace mercy and justice all of these uh so that's kind of like that midpoint of the hourglass the the fulcrum the, the center point all those things so he said i am the way the truth and the life he said i am the way the truth and the life no man comes unto the father except through me now there, I believe at the judgment, there's going to be people, probably Gotama Buddha, that didn't know Jesus' name. He lived before Jesus, um, but that responded to the light. And they will then, when they have the revelation and they have the opportunity, they will submit to Christ. He, they, he will, I think Gotama will point to the way and say, that's the way. He's right there. I had a, I think Gotama actually got a lot more of the way than a lot of other people, but Jesus said he was the way, is the way. That's Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua means Yahweh salvation, the I am salvation. Um, and that was his name in, in uh, Hebrew. 
before it got kind of translated, transliterated into Greek and then Latin and English. Also, similarities versus, oh, dis, uh, differences. In Gautama's conception, you have to do it on your own. No one's going to save you or help you. Uh, in Christianity, it's you have to actually come to a place of surrender and say, I can't do it on my own. And I tried for a decade. I tried so many things. Looking into astrology and tarot, trying to find myself in meditation, Tai Chi, martial arts. I was really disciplined. I was vegetarian. I tried being vegan. We're talking years. Um, eating healthy, yoga, yoga nidra, all this, like, I've been to Shambhala, Burning Man, Entheos, Base Coast, a lot of the festivals, you know, um, and done lots of different workshops and had wonderful experiences, uh, but those are encapsulated and qualified. Um, and I'll just tell you that, you know, even when you're trying to work on yourself so much in many ways, uh, for me, I'm on the grace policy. And even when I was at Vipassana, I was kind of like, I'm still on the grace policy. If there's grace, if there's forgiveness, I mean, I'm, I don't want to like, go through 18 eons of suffering, even if I could. <laughs> in eon, in the Buddhist conception, is like the birth and death of the galaxy or whatever. We're talking billions of years, if that's the worldview you're taking. Anyway, um, another main difference is resurrection. So Gautama said, when you're dead, you're dead. And that was actually one of the main issues for him was like, when you're dead, you're dead. And that is one of the conclusions of why this is meaningless and sucks kind of. And like, so he was like, I, to, to bring in resurrection, to bring in that death is not the final enemy. The death is not sort of this sort of trump card. Jesus, when he died on the cross and was put in the tomb and that tomb was guarded and there was eyewitnesses. And three days later, all of a sudden, the Romans are saying, yeah, he came and he, he came out and the, the Hebrew Pharisees are saying, don't tell anyone, here's a bunch of money. Say that the disciples stole the body. But the disciples say, we saw him. And even when the disciples were martyred and killed, they did not change their story. They weren't getting rich off this story. They got martyred and killed for this story. And they said, no, we're being honest. We saw him. We touched his body. We handled him. He was raised from the dead after being dead for like three days. The actual number of hours, I'm not sure about, because it depends on what time he was raised and all that, but really dead, 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 and really alive, <laughs> and able to ascend up into the air. Like, there's no tomb. You can go and visit Gotama's tomb. You can go and visit Mohan. Well, Gotama's b remains are actually spread out amongst a number of, like, kind of mounds, and his remains, there's interesting things about his remains and all that. Uh, Mohammed, you can go and visit his tomb. You can't find Jesus' tomb. You just go to Israel and you visit an empty cave. Now, some people think Christ's tomb is in India. I don't feel there's enough evidence um, to support that. But maybe there, maybe there's a famous Christian missionary that went there. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, that's there's um, there's mysteries that will be solved but his disciples said they saw him they watched him ascend up and he said i'm coming back and i'm gonna come back and with i'm gonna cleanse the earth basically there's gonna be the judgment there's gonna be no more war he's gonna make nations stop fighting he's gonna turn their swords into uh, plow, uh, plows and their spears into pruning hooks. So basically that trillions of dollars that are going towards the military industrial complex will go towards feeding people and good stuff. It's going to be amazing. I mean, even now there's apparently we grow enough food to feed 12 billion people. So the whole myth about overpopulation, not true. I live in Canada. There's tons of space here. We just don't share and distribute properly. So right now we have 7 billion people on the planet. Apparently right now we have enough food to feed 12 billion per year. Um, a lot of it gets thrown away or whatever. Check out Okanagan Gleaners if you want to support people saving food that's on its way out and then dehydrating it and sending it overseas. And it's awesome. Um, so basically, yeah, resurrection and restoration is the Christian eschatology of end times. 
whereas um, Buddhism is sort of a, they call it nirvana, if you, you know, if you can get out. Buddha claims he was and that he would die and he would go into nirvana, which was like a type of emptiness, nothingness. There's a, not even a beingness. There's kind of a question between being and non-being and he's kind of like, no, this is higher than that. And, and it's, um, I'm not going to answer those questions. And he said it was, but it, in a way it's almost... Uh, it's vague, but it sounds a bit like spiritual suicide, but at the same time, um, yeah, definitely no identification with the body, no identification with even identity, I guess you could say. Whereas in Christianity, it's this idea that there's a fulfillment of your identity, of who you're supposed to be, and there's an eternal sort of relationship and adventure and new heavens and new earth. Another main difference, we talked a bit about love and joy in Christianity. There's this sort of like, if you're red hot, passionate for the Lord and loving him and you're full of joy, the Lord, that's going to help you to stay on the straight and narrow. Whereas um, in Buddhism, any sort of uh, excess, even if it's an excess of joy is a problem. You're supposed to remain equanimous because in Buddhism basically says, if you go up, you're going to come down. Whereas in Christianity, it's like, well, whether you're up or down, you're serving the Lord. It's sort of this extreme devotion that then helps you to be balanced. Whereas in Gautama's perspective, it was more like, you can eat a good meal, but don't get too attached. If it starts to get too delicious and you want too much, you might do gluttony. So then, you know, don't really like enjoy things too much, kind of. Or that's kind of this liberation to be able to enjoy it without too much um in christianity that's only possible through the holy spirit the work of the holy spirit um and sanctification uh and we can be content in christianity there's a similarity of where paul talks about being in being content in abundance or lack being content being hungry or uh, full being having lavish surroundings or nothing sleeping in a rock or whatever um so there is a contentment, but the contentment is like a devotion and a hope in Christ, a full sort of uh, it, love and joy and devotion is recommended. And I guess there could be, uh, Buddhists could say, well, you have to be fully devoted to the Eightfold Path and fully, so there's, but there's always this kind of equanimous, like don't get, you can't take the middle path, don't get too attached. Or I do like the analogy of, uh, I've heard the analogy used both in Christianity and in um, Buddhism of like a guitar and how like the strings need to be uh, tight but not too tight. So there is an element, but there's, I guess with Christianity it would be that the strings are like perfectly where they're supposed to be in, in love with the Lord and um, that, that they'll be led by the Holy Spirit to be like that. It's a type of freedom that comes from that extreme love that will result in a type of balance i guess you could say in the old testament there was a there's a verse about the the priests not having their heads shaved but not having long hair this sort of like i don't know if they meant like this or probably longer but i don't know anyway i'm still trying to get the right haircut so i can get into heaven <laughs> other differences yeah redemption purpose Buddhism says no, kind of like Ecclesiastes, although Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of Solomon, which is about 500 years earlier, or 400 years earlier than uh, Gautama, Prince Sakyamuni, Solomon does say, you know, even though everything's meaningless and vanity, you there is going to be a judgment, there is a God, you basically should you just try to follow his commandments, and because you're going to have to answer for your life, and and that's the best way. So... But he basically is not thrilled with life down there. And Solomon was rich and he had all these experiences. It's kind of a similar story where he got to experience pleasure and lavish riches. And he kind of, exp a lot of people maybe that are poor, they think, oh, if I had millions of dollars, this world would be awesome. But like basically people that have had millions of dollars start like finding, seeking spiritual answers because they realize that security and money is not uh doesn't even come close to filling the void that's in us you know and a lot of theologians say that void is placed there so that we eventually seek god because other things even relationships with other people do not fill us uh superficial identities and i'm talking even your gender you might think oh if i just get a sex change i'll have a different gender and then i'll be happy 
It's still superficial. It's not going to fulfill you. So in Christianity, it's saying your identity needs to be in the relationship with your maker, your creator, and that divine spiritual intimacy and your purpose. And then your identity flows from that. It's not in your appearance, even your gender or race or other things like that. Not to say that those aren't distinctions that are flavors or whatever. Relationship, I guess we'll uh, go we'll land on that relationship and what works. Um, so some, I've tried, you know, some people may say, well, you didn't try Buddhism long enough. And uh, yeah, maybe, but I've, when I went through a huge heartbreak, my wife left me, um, went with, I found out she was with another guy. It was like, and I was trying to do my meditation and my Tai Chi and it was like, my mind was, I couldn't even observe like two breaths, stay present for a couple breaths before it was like, mm. and I prayed, I prayed in Jesus name, help me most high. And it was like, peace, a wave of peace. Like I slept, I was able to finish my degree because I was in my last year of university. That was a miracle. Um, and well, probably not the last year of university ever. I might do more, but who knows? Um, I'm going to uh, see if I can switch the view here. No, so I'll have to like just flip this around. I want to show this. Mm. This is kind of a, a drawing of the conceptions of each. So this would be the, the uh, Buddhist uh, worldview. Okay, this idea of like seven heaven realms and earth and seven hell realms and suffering in there. Again, it's a little bit of a a quandary because basically Buddha said everything is arising and passing away and changing. Uh, but if it is, then this this whole business here seems to be that in Buddha's cosmology that it's a permanent thing, that it's it, that there are these principles, even karma, that are permanent, the Dharma these type of permanence things. So I think that kind of undermines some of this conception of everything changing. And so uh, he said, there's no beginning and end. I would say you could draw a whole circle, even if this is the structure of reality, draw a circle around it and say that's created. Well, so Christianity says there's a beginning and uh, a creator and that there was a fall, that, that time is not just going round and round. Sure, there might be these, these um, cycles within our our experience but that those cycles are on a trajectory and that that trajectory uh, there was like a major fall and that um, that Christ actually came to bridge that impossible gap Christianity says the Buddha could not have uh, been perfect enough to get into heaven on his own that he still, if he's in heaven, it's because he's covered under the blood of Jesus and uh, forgiven. And he's accepted that grace. And so I hope he will be. I hope that uh, I get to hang out with him there. And um, yeah, there is uh, in Christianity, like this idea. Now, some people say, is it e a conscious torment, eternal torment, or is it that you're annihilated? You know, um, there's there's evidence in the Hebrew language for both. But it's, you know, at the judgment, if you're not accepting Christ and as your Lord and Savior, and even before, actually, I mean, our the choice is to be made today. Today is the salvation, you know, whether you accept that the Creator loves you, that He sent Jesus, that the witness of His death and resurrection are true, that... You need forgiveness and need, you're not going to try to be God on your own and rebel and you submit to his will and, and his love and grace. And then you're going to share that because part of being forgiven is that you're going to forgive others and love others and that we don't own ourselves. And there's this promise of union and uh, new heavens and a new earth.